Should Israel enforce God's laws? This is part two. The last time we read a few of God's commands and commandments or laws given to the Israel people, turn to Deuteronomy 17. If there be found among you within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of the heaven, which I have not commanded. And then he goes on and tells how they're to conduct an investigation of this. This is not to be done on hearsay. This is to be done by the rules of evidence and so many witnesses and so on to see that a sin has been committed. Then verse 6, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so thou shalt put the evil away from among you. So the punishment is given for what purpose? Well, to put the evil away from among the Israelites in the Israelite nation. Now today we have quite an argument from the so-called Christian churches that the way to put evil away or to stop evil in the land is just to preach to the people. They deny punishment or judgment and say, well, instead what we need is more radio stations and more churches and more pamphlets and more money to publish God's Word. And uh, they say that the most important thing really is not what is happening to you in this life anyway. What is important is to, quote, save souls so they can go to heaven when they die. So the emphasis of modern preaching is primarily on what happens to you after you're over or through with this physical life, whereas God's laws, statutes, and judgments were given for this physical life upon the earth. So the preaching today is not related to God's law and to God's judgments or punishments for the evildoer at all, or at least very little of it. Now, this idea that the way to put evil away among the Israel people by preaching, can you imagine any people in past history, present, or in the future until the kingdom who had more preaching and more witnessing of the power of God's word than these Israel people? to whom God was telling them, if someone comes and tries to turn you away from me, you put them to death. Just think of some of the things that had happened to these people just before God gave them these commandments. There were the miracles in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of the Egyptians, the waters cured, the manna from heaven, water from a rock, men were consumed for offering strange fire, the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and some of his rebellious compatriots, the brazen serpent healed the people, and on and on. No generation before or after had had more powerful preaching, evidence, and witness of God's word than that generation. And yet it was that generation that God said to them, we've got to give you laws to put away evil from the midst of you. God did not say, well, now all you have to do is teach my word, and tell the people what I've done, and they're going to turn and quit sinning. No, this is the same God who said of man in Genesis 8 after the flood, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The Creator God knows what kind of man he has upon the earth. And God said through Moses of the Israelites, in case you think it's just the non-Israelites who are the sinful, wicked people, in Exodus 32, 9, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, we are their descendants. We came down through many generations from these same people. So, unless we have become some sort of super-creatures, substantially more moral than they were, preaching is not going to change us any more than it apparently did them. So, God said to Israel, to put away evil from among you, I am commanding you to do such and so. Certain people committing certain crimes are to be executed. Not for vengeance, 
but to put evil away from Israel. Turn back to Exodus 22, so you don't think that Pastor Emery or God himself are really so bloodthirsty because all crimes were not punishable by death, although the death penalty was held in abeyance, as we'll see later. In Exodus 22 are a number of things, and I think it behooves us to read some of them. They are so seldom read to our people. Beginning with thievery here in Exodus 22, verse 1, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. And the principle here, of course, the ox is larger and takes longer to reach maturity, so the penalty is greater, five instead of four for the sheep. Verse 2, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. This uh, used to be in some of our laws to some extent, that if an individual killed a thief during the night or in the dark, it was considered justifiable homicide. But if he killed a thief in the daytime, there was an investigation because of the possibility that since he could see the thief, recognize him, the thief could be caught later without bloodshed. It says here in verse 3, If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. In other words, God says it's better to catch the thief, require him to make restitution, than it is to kill him. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If he does not have enough money to restore, according to the prescribed, the prescription given here in the law, then he is farmed out, sold to the highest bidder, and works to pay back the money he has stolen, plus, of course, the judgment of four or five or double or whatever it is. Now, we have an example here of a Jew land fraud king in Arizona who recently was put in jail after 20 years of defrauding the people of an estimated 50 millions of dollars. The man has been put in prison, and as far as I know, the newspapers have not reported that any of his property has been confiscated at all. Apparently it will be passed on to his children or the rest of his family, all of these millions of dollars he has stolen from people. Now God's law, of course, would require that all of his property be confiscated. If that is not enough to make restitution, the man would work the rest of his life, if necessary. For vengeance, no, so that others will hear and fear and no more do such things in Israel. Verse 4, If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So if whatever he stole is recovered intact, then he only restores double. If a man steals an automobile today, he's caught with the automobile. He owes the owner of that automobile two automobiles. If he wrecks it or sells it, he owes him five or four, as the judges shall decide. Now listen to some of the good, sensible rules that we're reading here and consider that most churches in today who profess to teach God's word do not even inform their congregations that these simple, sensible regulations of life for man are in the Bible. Verse 5 of Exodus 22. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed in another man's field, the best of his own field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. Verse 6, if fire break out and catch in thorns so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn or the field be consumed therewith, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Do you mean God Almighty who has such great and important things to take care of in heaven and on earth stoop so low as to write a law telling you what to do if you set a fire and it burned up your neighbor's cornfield? Well, of course he did because it is God who is the ruler in Israel who has given Israel laws for her good, telling Israel what to do when such and so happens. And um, unless you are totally out of tune with God, you see the righteousness of these laws. The man's responsible, he restores, puts back the injured man in the place where he was. 
If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. This is what we read in the previous verses. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he have put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. You give something to your neighbor to keep while you're on vacation, and when you come back, it's gone. He says it's stolen, but you can't find a thief. There has to be an investigation to see whether he stole it or not. Does God assume that all of these people are honest and forthright and never lie? No. He knows what kind of creatures we are, so he makes provision for it. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, or for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. In other words, if he has stolen it, or possibly has caused it to be lost, he pays double just like the thief would. If a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass, or an ox, or a sheep, or any beast to keep, and it die, or be hurt, or driven away, no man seeing it, in other words, not stolen, just mysterious disappearance, then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both, that he hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. If it's just disappeared, and there's no way to find out what has happened to it, then he makes an oath that he hasn't taken it, and the uh, merchandise or the property is gone, but no one has to make good for it. Verse 12, And if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution unto the owner, unto the owner thereof. In other words, if he hasn't protected it from being stolen while in his possession, then he has to restore. You take some valuables over to your neighbor, or he gives them to you, and they're stolen while they're in your possession. It's your fault. You accepted this responsibility when you took the goods. And so God says, well, all right, I'll give you laws for even such little things. To see what the existence of these laws does, it prevents controversy in Israel. Because God is the judge. God is the lawgiver. God is the ruler. If something uh, like this takes place, you don't have to go and say, well, now, this is such and so has happened. What do we do? Well, you turn to the Bible, and the Bible says this is what you do. And that is the end of the controversy. And then the neighbors can live together in peace and harmony because God has settled it in a righteous way. Verse 13, If it be torn in pieces, then, it, then let him bring it for witness, and he shall not make good that which was torn. If the wolf comes in and kills the sheep, then the man who has been keeping the sheep for the neighbor is not responsible, because obviously he can't protect from all things. Now to just transpose that to modern days, let's say that one of you young men are going with your family on vacation and you have a very beautiful automobile that you've worked on for many hours and you want someone to watch over it while you're gone. So you go to the neighbor and say, well, could I park my car in your yard while I'm gone? So you, and you watch it so it isn't stolen. The neighbor says, yes. The neighbor has accepted responsibility. If the automobile is stolen, he is required under God's law to restore that automobile to you. But if someone has an accident and drives across the curb in the lawn and smashes into the automobile, then it's not your fault. You don't have to restore it. Then it's lost. You see, these things can be taken by judges and ruled on in today's society. How many times have you heard the argument, well, God's laws were given for a people who lived in rural areas in an agricultural society, and they had restitution for beasts and for oxen, for sheep and so on. You can't relate that to today. You can. Obviously you can. We're not stupid, even though we are sinners. God knows we have good minds, and we can take the principle given here, transpose it to modern society, use it, it makes sense, it is righteous, and it would eliminate problems between people, these laws of liability and so on. Verse 14, And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. 
you borrow your neighbor's lawnmower to mow your lawn, and it goes kaput while you're using it, you fix it before you return it back to him. But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good. If it be an hired thing, it came for his hire. You hire your neighbor to mow your lawn with his lawnmower, and it breaks down while he's mowing it. That's not your fault. That's his problem. Isn't it amazing how sensible God is in these laws? And the second most amazing thing about that is I imagine there isn't one churchgoer in a thousand. I may be overestimating or underestimating. There probably isn't one churchgoer in a thousand who knows that God laid down the rules for your neighbor's lawnmower breaking down in your yard. They don't know that. And so we stumble along in blindness. Every time something happens, we try to decide between two men without any divine principle as to what should be done. And when we're through, someone is angry, upset, and those neighbors are never friends, never speak to any, each other anymore. Why? Because they didn't know the divine law principle as given in the Bible. And these things, this one chapter and these several related chapters, can be related to anything that could happen in modern society. Society and man have not changed so that God's law is now no longer applicable. How about Exodus 21, verses 18 and 19? And if men strive together, and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. So if you get in a fight with someone, you injure the other man. If he recovers, no problem, except only he shall pay for the loss of his time, and he shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Now, isn't it strange that that is one thing that we do keep? That is one thing that we follow. When someone injures someone else in an automobile accident or at work or in an assault or in a fight between people or neighbors or something like that, we recognize the law of liability and the one man is allowed to sue the other and recover damages for his injury and even for his loss of time or earnings from work. Now, why do we keep that one but not the others? I'll tell you why because we have allowed to grow up in this great nation a class of people called attorneys. And they make money on litigations between people where one has been injured by another. God's law makes no provision for attorneys or lawyers. Have you ever thought about that? God's law makes provision for investigators and judges and witnesses, and that is all. The state does the investigation. The state enforces the law of liability in the land. No place for attorneys. Just think of the hundreds of millions of dollars paid out by individuals on injury suits in the United States of America, and one-third or more of it goes to this class of people called attorneys. It doesn't go to the injured person. And in many cases, it doesn't go according to any equity. It goes according to who is the best attorney in front of the jury or the judge. You see, if we followed God's law as it is given, first of all, we would not have attorneys. Secondly, everything would be decided according to God's law. We wouldn't even need all of this legislation of these laws that we have. So again, some of you, I'm sure, are surprised at how sensible God is, but of course... Uh, God goofed on this death penalty, didn't he, on putting people to death for killing people. We can understand the righteousness of a man who set a fire and burned down his neighbor's cornfield or his neighbor's house having to pay the loss to his neighbor. But putting a man to death for killing another man, isn't that terrible, cruel, and unusual punishment? No. These are given so that you will put evil away from Israel and in controversy between people. Let's read uh, verse 16 and 17 in Exodus 22. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her unto him, 
he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Can you imagine what would happen in the United States of America if every young man in this country knew that any girl he seduced would be his wife, period, if the father desired, or the father could lay on him a fine of an amount the father desired. You wouldn't have much in the way of premarital problems, would you? The propagandists today, one of their favorite phrases is, you cannot legislate morals. Do you realize what God is doing here when he gave us these laws? He was legislating morality. He was giving us laws which would create a moral climate in Israel by providing punishment for certain things. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. By now, someone has certainly said, well, Pastor Emery, this is all sounds great, but what if the perpetrator of the crime, the man who assaulted the other man or the man who burned down the other man's cornfield, what if he would not restore or pay back the loss for which he was responsible? Did God think of that? Well, yes, he did. Deuteronomy 17, we'll begin in verse 8. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, between matters of controversy within thy gates, then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. In other words, if you can't decide the judgment at the lower investigation right on the spot where it was done or in the um, small town or whatever, and thou shalt come unto the priests the Levites and unto the judge that shall be in those days and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. You take it to a higher court. You take it to the men who have had more experience in these matters. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show thee. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee. According to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee. And according to the judgment which they shall tell thee thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand nor to the left. So here is an admonition as to how you go through what we would call a court system and then the judge's order is to be obeyed. And you listen to this. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. If a man refuses to work or pay the restitution, he's executed. If he refuses to pay the medical cost of the man he is injured, he's executed. If the young man refuses to marry the girl that he's supposed to marry, he's executed. Isn't this a terrible, cruel God? No, God has given them the way that is right the way that causes the least injury to their neighbor, to their fellow man. And do you realize what God has given them? Instructions on how to love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you recognize that? You know, the modern teachers are great ones to say, well, all we have to know is Jesus Christ and he'll come and live in our heart. And he'll tell us what to do, and we'll love God, and we'll love our neighbors as ourselves. And then they start about loving. And then they start telling us about how to love people. And isn't it strange, but most of what they tell us about loving other people is loving other people who are evil and wicked and sinners? No, the obedience to God's law, the placing the injured party back in a position as near to what he had been in before, or the removal of those who kill or deliberately injure other people from the society is the greatest manifestation of loving your neighbor as yourself that a society can provide for. Now, I think most of you recognize that if this were carried out, that you soon would have a dearth of murders in the land. Thievery would be practically unknown. People who've been in some of the Arab countries tell me that over there when a man steals something and is caught, they cut off one of his hands. 
If he steals a second time, they cut off his other hand. And I know a few have told me they have seen people over there with one hand missing. But I've never heard of anyone telling about someone seeing someone with two hands missing. They also tell me that a person over there can leave his car parked anywhere, leave the doors unlocked, leave their cameras in the seat, park their motorcycle or bicycle any place, and never have to worry about it being stolen. Why? Because they punish the evildoer and put away evil from their nation. Just recently there was a great furor because the Arabs over there whipped, I think it was an Englishman, because he had either brought in or manufactured some alcoholic beverages and was passing it out or giving it to his Arab friends. That is forbidden under Arabic law. So what did they do with him? They whipped him publicly. And do you realize that everyone in the United States and Britain and probably in Western Europe knew that that man was whipped over in Arabia for furnishing alcoholic beverages to an Arabian. How many of you think that American citizens will now go over there and furnish alcoholic beverages to any Arab? I don't think so. One man whipped, a million of them learn a lesson. That's God's way of doing things. Very simple, very effective. Verse 13, And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. That is the purpose for this. One man is punished so that thousands may learn. Regarding these civil lawsuits, I was recently reading a magazine article about them, and the judges and the attorneys have admitted that one of the major problems regarding liability is the lack of ability to collect. Millions of dollars are owed in this country to thousands of people who have gotten court judgments for the injury, but they can't collect it. The uh, man hides his assets, moves, just refuses to pay or whatever. Well, that wouldn't happen under God's law after one or two or three of them were executed for trying to get away from paying what they owe. And by now someone has asked, well, Pastor Emery, what about people who lie? How can you get righteous judgment in a court of law if somebody tells lies, if the witness lies about a person. And um, this happens many times. The police admit that the problems inside the court are multiplied because they cannot depend upon the witnesses telling the truth. In fact, the witness may tell one thing one time and one thing another. So what about a witness who accuses a person of stealing something and he didn't steal it? What about a witness who accuses a person of committing a murder or an assault and the person didn't do it? Didn't God think of that? Well, yes, he did. Turn to Deuteronomy 19, verse 16. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. This covers everything, every criminal or civil investigation. Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother. Now, just think. This is a diligent inquiry. Now, in most cases at law, you would have enough witnesses so it would be fairly easy to ascertain the truth. But suppose you only have one or two. Now, in a case of a man stealing something and it being found in his hand, that alone is a part of the evidence. But suppose there's only one or two witnesses to this and they actually uh, lie about this person. Well, they're to carry on an investigation, not some 30-minute interrogatory, but a long investigation because this is a serious matter. But what happens if they find he has testified falsely? Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Now isn't that something for punishment? I wonder how many judges or attorneys have ever thought 
of the possibility that would be an effective way to stop lying in the courtroom under oath. Here's an example, and perhaps you hadn't thought of this. What about an employee or someone who has stolen a hundred dollars? And this happens very often. The police will tell you this. The employer comes in and says, no, he didn't steal a hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars is missing. You see, in the case of God's law, that would mean that the thief would owe the man a thousand dollars. All right, if the truth were that he had stolen only one hundred, and it was found that the employer was lying about the employee stealing the five hundred dollars, then after the investigation, they would rule that the employer or the man who was supposedly the victim would owe the thief double of what he had testified about. If he had testified the thief had stolen 500 when the thief had only stolen 100, he would have to pay the thief $1,000 and the thief would only have to pay him 200. The insurance companies say that this is one of the reasons why they spend in the United States millions upon millions of dollars investigating claims because someone's property is broken into and something is stolen. The person who owns the property takes advantage of the theft and reports other items as being stolen. And this goes on all the time. A thief will come in and steal a television set. When they report it to their insurance company, the man says, oh, he stole a television and four radios and three rifles and the bed spread off my wife's bed and the silverware and so on. This happens all the time. Under God's law, the man who reported the theft as greater than it was would be required to pay back to the person he lied against twice as much as he falsely claimed. Can anyone here think of anything or any way of doing this that would work better with man as we know him to straighten him up and make him treat his fellow man as he's supposed to. And I've only read a few of these, of course. All right. If the charge were murder, if the witness testified under oath in court that a man had committed murder and it was later found that the man had not and the witness had lied, what would they do? Would they release the innocent man and chide the liar and give him 30 days in jail for contempt of court? No, he would be executed. One of the reasons we have such high taxes in America is because you people are paying for days and hours and months of, and years of hundreds of thousands of people's time in the court system trying to find out what is truth because there is literally, under our laws, no penalty for lying. And witnesses go before the courts every day and lie and lie and lie. In some cases, of course, to get out of punishment themselves. In some cases, for vengeance or hatred of another person. God's law, if obeyed, would end that very quickly with the requirement of paying back of restitution and or execution of the false witness. They would end the false accusers. Verse 20. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. That is the whole reason and the result of divine judgment. It is not rehabilitation as they say our laws should be today. It is not just to get someone off the street who might injure another person. It is not vengeance, as those who oppose God's law say. The purpose is a better society, justice and equity in the land, and peace for the people. That is the purpose of God's law. One criminal is punished for the benefit of of millions of others who will hear and fear and no more commit such things in Israel. So then what is our problem? We've got this book and we've got these laws. What is the problem? I believe today the major problem is the churches which teach that this law is put away. For ye are not under the law but under grace. 
some will admit personally, individually, if you question them, that that verse is addressed to Christian believers. It is not addressed to the murderer. It is not addressed to the thief. What about the murderer? What about the thief? Is he under the law or is he under grace? 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. Remember the one we just read. Perjured persons in a murder case would be executed. Paul writes in the New Testament, the law is made for these kind of people, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, is this Old Testament theology that's been put away? No, I'm reading this in the New Testament. And Paul even goes on and says, and this is not the end of the sentence, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Paul says, according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law is made for the lawless and the disobedient. That is New Testament theology. And yet we have a great host of preachers in this nation who say, well, we're under the New Testament, we're not under the Old. The New Testament tells us the murderer and the man who violates God's law is under the law. That's what it was made for. Bible doctrine has not changed. Proverbs 13 and verse 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. That has to do with people in society. If we refuse to punish the thief, it is because we hate him. If we punish him, we are showing love for him. The state of Minnesota has had a restitution, or at least a partial restitution law for some time, and they are putting men to work to pay back that which they have stolen. And they have discovered it rehabilitates these men, and most of them never have trouble with the law again. In fact, some of them are learning a trade which they didn't have before by working to restore. It has been very successful. What are they learning? They are learning exactly what they could learn if they just read God's Word. It's already in here. Proverbs 19, verse 25. Smite a scorner, and the simple will beware, and reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Verse 29. Judgments are prepared for scorners, and stripes for the back of fools. Proverbs 21, and verse 11. When the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. That's what we read in the law. When one man is punished, thousands of people learn wisdom. And that's what Solomon wrote. 29 and verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom. God's judgments, God's punishment on those who disobey his law brings wisdom to the people. It makes them wise. You take a man down here in front of the courthouse, and by the way, Deuteronomy authorizes whip, whipping. You take a few criminals down in front of the courthouse and whip them in public, and you know what happens? All of those people standing around and watching that are wiser than they were the day before. That's right. They learn wisdom as they see God's law. How about Proverbs 28 and verse 9? He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. We as a nation and as a people have turned away from even hearing God's law. Is it possible our prayers are an abomination to God? Millions of people I know pray to God for deliverance from the crime and the corruption and even from world communism, which they see about ready to make an attack on our great nation, and yet are those prayers an abomination to God because we will not do the simple things of the law which will turn and save this nation, of which we've seen only a few examples. Turn to Deuteronomy 4. 
God said through Moses in verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this, or this law, or the doing of the law, is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath gone so nigh unto him, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? If America enforced God's laws in this nation, and the results were what God say they would be, this would be a greater testimony to the heathen of God and his word than all the missionaries who have ever lived and died since they began to go to the heathen. Just think on that. If America followed God's law, it would be a testimony the rest of the world would see. There is no source of wisdom greater than God's law for correcting mortal men. Yes, correcting this great race of Israelites who are what? Sinners in need of correction. Do you really think Israelites today are more moral and of higher caliber than our ancestors to whom the law was given? Have we changed? Are we better now because of Billy Graham and the other preachers? No, we are the same people. We are the descendants of those to whom the law was given to be enforced in the nation for the people's good. God said in Isaiah 26, 9, or the prophet did, When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And Paul in the New Testament wrote in Romans 3 and verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The great truth which has escaped most of Christendom is that faith in Jesus Christ who is the God who gave Israel the law at Sinai, establishes the law in Israel. The unbelievers are not going to keep the law. They're not going to enforce it. It is the believer. It is Christendom. It is Christian Israel who is to enforce God's law and make it as an example not only to Israel, but to all of the world. May God speed the day, and I believe from prophecy... This day is coming when Israel will turn to God's righteous laws and be that example to the rest of the earth. Let's stand. Our Father, the God of Israel, we thank you for the evidence in thy word and the evidence from history that your law is righteous, that your judgments are true, that you have given these things to our, for our good. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to see and understand that our obedience to thee is for our good to glorify thy name in Israel and through the world. In Jesus' name, amen.